This program is made possible by the friends and partners of Stevenson Ministries and the Houston Faith Church family. Tonight we're going to uh, address something that kind of uh, arises as a question mark for many people, and then you can apply the truth to your life as we move along in it. Uh, but it has to do with faith, it has to do with salvation, it has to do with righteousness, but it also clears up uh, a little scriptural misunderstanding that people make. So if you will, let me start with some basic stuff about our Christian walk. And a lot of this is so that you can keep it in your heart, make sure you understand it right. And then at some point, God can pull it out of you to help another person. Turn to the book of Romans chapter 3. We'll start here. The idea that I want to start with is how a person becomes righteous, how a person is saved, which for those in real Christianity, it's a no-brainer. This is the heart of our belief system, the very first step, the, the core, the heart, the, the very uh, uh, elementary essence of Christianity begins with this truth. It's that we are made right with God by believing in Jesus Christ. And that's the only way that you're right with God. There's nothing else you could possibly do or not do that would affect how right you are with God. Because Christ is the only way to be right with God. You believe in him, you receive this thing called righteousness and it settles all disputes. <clears throat> Verse 20, Romans 3.20, therefore by the deeds of the law... No flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So it's just talking about the law of Moses, talking about the Old Testament law that they all lived under. No one is justified or made righteous, same word. No one is made righteous by the law, or we can say the works of the law, by doing all of those commands. No one is made righteous by doing. Got it? But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there's no difference. All have sinned and come short or fallen short of the glory of God. We are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, through the, through the purchase of our soul by Jesus Christ, we are made right. That's how we're justified, by the purchase. It was a legal, spiritual purchase that Jesus made with his blood that justified you. There is nothing else that justified you but the legal purchase. What it does, it does a lot of things, but what it does, one thing it does is it helps you esteem the value of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's not Jesus plus anything else. It's just Jesus. He's not something you add into some belief system. He is the belief system. Amen. And then he goes in and says here, verse 27, what is boasting then? Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? No, but by the law of faith. No longer are we under some law of Moses with all the rules. We are under the law of faith, which is the law of the spiritual law that you must believe in Christ in order to be saved or to be right with God. So there's no boasting. You can't boast about how good of a Christian you are. There's people in other religions that boast about how good they are. Uh, Christians cannot boast about how good they are. So you just eliminate that from your thought process, from your prayer life. Never should you tell another person, well, you know, I've been I don't know why God's not answering my prayer. I've been, uh, wait a second, there's no boasting. And then even in your own personal time with God, you shouldn't boast. You shouldn't think to yourself, now God, boy, I've been, you know, I've been giving and going to church and I've been praying more than probably most people. Where are you? Well, he's further now than when you started praying. <laughs> You've just exempted yourself from closeness to God because you're coming on your own merit rather than coming in Christ. The only way to approach God is through Christ, through his blood. The only way to get too close to God is through his son, not through your own goodness. Uh, 
Therefore, we conclude, verse 28, we conclude a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Look at Romans chapter 4, verse 3, or let's read verse 1. Romans 4, 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? So Abraham was our example for New Testament belief in Christ, righteousness by faith alone. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham, all Abraham had to do to be called righteous or it says accounted, credited. Righteousness was credited to Abraham because he believed God. Just because he believed, not because he was great, just because he believed God, God said, okay, I'll give you credit. You're righteous. Verse four, now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. So if your good deeds of any sort are part of you being right with God, then you can look to God and say, now God, you owe me because I was nice to people this week. You owe me because I didn't eat some food that you said not to eat in the Old Testament. That's a work of the law. You're not made right by what you eat or didn't eat. So if if righteousness comes by your deeds, then God owes you your salvation. That's all he's saying. The wages are not counted as grace. If it's a wage, then it's not grace. So you cannot earn the blessing from God. You can't earn their salvation. You can't earn your healing. You cannot earn financial supply. You can't earn a spouse. You can't earn favor. You do not earn favor from God. Otherwise, it wouldn't be grace. And if, if it were by wages, then you could look at God and say, now, God, I've been X, Y, Z. You shouldn't let this happen to me because I've been good. Trying to move us all into what faith, there's a law of faith that you're going to have to learn how to live by. And it it erases all of those weird thoughts, all of those elementary false religious thoughts from your brain once you live by the law of faith, which is the law that I must hear from God and believe God and have an action responding or corresponding. So faith requires a belief and then an action. You're going to have to learn how to live like that. Look at Romans chapter 9. Verse 30. This is talking about Israel, the Jews who did not uh, receive the Messiah because they were still stuck in the works of the law, thinking that was good enough. They got stuck and they missed Jesus. Verse 30, what shall we say then that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. So the Gentiles who didn't care about God, know God or anything, believed the message and got got righteous. But Israel pursuing the law of righteousness has not attained to the law of righteousness. Here the Israelites were trying to be right with God by following all of the commands of the old and they missed the Savior which God said, I'm going to send you a saver because you can't, you keep failing at the law anyway. And none of you can keep the law. I've got to send you the Messiah. And so they missed it because they were still trying to follow Moses instead of Jesus. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. Go to Ephesians 2. All of this is probably pretty solid in your heart. If you've been in the Lord for a while, you understand this, right? This is the heart of everything. For every evangelical Christian who believes the real gospel, you know that you're saved by faith alone and not by works. But let's read this this scripture here, Ephesians chapter 2, very foundational. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works or not by works, lest anyone should boast about his works. Okay, that's very uh, settled, right? 
by grace, you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves, not what you could do or missed or uh, none of that. It's only the gift of God. It's a gift you couldn't earn. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. And then verse 10, I want to throw this in for later. Verse 10 says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. So remember this, you are saved without works, but once you're saved, you are his workmanship in Christ. We are his workmanship. He has transformed us because of our faith in Christ so that we could do good works. You're transformed and worked into this holy person so that you can live a a different life, so that you can be good, so so that you can live a a purposeful life doing good. Isn't that exciting? Now turn to the book of James chapter 2. James chapter 2 talks about faith without works is dead. And we understand that principle, but when you read the passage, it's thrown a few people off. I want to make sure it doesn't throw you. James chapter 2, verse 14, James says this. He says, what does it profit, my brother? Oh, oh, first of all, first of all, go to James chapter 1, verse 1. It says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. The what? Who's he writing to? He's writing to the 12 tribes. Now, he's writing to Jews, right? He's not writing to Gentiles. He's writing to Jews. In verse 2, my brethren counted all joy. So he's talking about saved Jews. He's talking about brothers in Christ. He's talking about say, he's writing to saved Jews. This, this letter was actually written before the other, the other letters were written. But this is in the beginning. And he's writing to saved Jews. Just keep that in mind. Verse 14, he says, what does it profit, my brethren? Oh, no, no, no. Let's read verse 8. James 2, verse 8. It says, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you, sh- you, love your na- you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. He's referring to obeying the love command. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So he's not telling us that we're convicted by the law as a transgressor. He's talking about the Jews should know that the law convicts them as transgressors. Because the law, even in the law, there's, a, there's in there, love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 10, for, whatever sh- for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he's guilty of all. He's reminding them that, hey, look, you've got to keep all 613 commands perfectly or you're guilty of all of them. Again, he's not telling Christians to keep the law. We already know that the law makes everyone guilty. Verse 11, what he's addressing is that Jews who had believed in Jesus were stuck. They were still thinking that keeping the law made them more righteous. They had believed the message. He's writing to them as believers. uh, But they were stuck in the old way. They weren't moving on into faith in Christ. They believed that he rose from the dead. They probably got baptized in water. They might've been filled with the Holy Spirit, but in their minds and in their heart, their faith was not active toward Christ. Okay. Verse 11, for he who said, do not commit adultery also said, do not murder. Now, if you don't commit adultery, but you do murder. And of course, Jesus said, if you hate someone without a cause, you're a murderer. You, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Not the law of Moses, but by the law of liberty. By, by, by the law of faith, by the law of love, by the law of what is right under the new covenant. Live that way. That God knows your heart. <clears throat> Verse 13, for judgment is without mercy to those who have shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So at this point, he's not talking about salvation. He's talking about lifestyle. He's talking to believers who have already been saved and born again. And he's and expressing to them, trying to pull them out of their old religious, uh, dead way of life. Which is what we do a lot, don't we? We say some of these same things to people about, hey, it's not about the candle lighting and all of the little rigmarole that you've created for your religious self 
Come out and let's live a real full life in Christ. So that's another way to say it. <clears throat> then he says, verse 14, which is where the, the conflict begins with some people. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Can faith save him? Skip verse 15 and 16 for seven, uh, 15 and 16. Go to 17. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Faith, if it does not have works, is dead. What does this mean? Does this mean we're supposed to believe in Jesus and then follow the law of Moses or our faith was dead? No, because Paul's already explained that we are saved by faith alone and not by any works lest you begin to boast about what, what you're doing right or wrong. Right? So, see, so he's not saying that, that faith, I mean, that salvation requires a righteousness. He's not saying that righteousness requires you to believe in Jesus and follow the rules pretty good. He's not saying that, but he is saying something very important here. What does it profit if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. We can say it this way. Maybe what James is referring to is that these Jews had believed in Christ and had, had active faith. I mean, they got baptized in water uh, with the 5,000, let's say. We don't know when they got saved, but let's say the first 3,000 that got saved, then the next 5,000 included some of these 12 tribes that he's writing to. And they got saved. They believed in Jesus. They got dunked in water. They were born again. Now he's addressing them about, wait a second, you need to have some action with your... So now your faith has been dormant. You haven't lived a new covenant life in Christ You've neglected all of these new principles that you're supposed to live by, and you've not been effective in your walk with God because your faith is now dead. It doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. He's just saying your faith has not been alive toward Christ. You're having more faith in the law of Moses than in Christ. So he's talking about a faith that doesn't do anything for their life. But let's keep reading because it gets even uh, more sticky here. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. Well, that's a very valid teaching, isn't it? Hey, listen, if you've got faith, we'll know it. When the, when the people that came to Jesus had faith, he saw it. They broke the roof. He said, when he saw their faith, he said, your sins are forgiven and get your bed and go home. You can see people's faith. And so basically we can look at you and know what you believe by what you do. And it's frustrating, and that, that's where you see Christians get frustrated with family and friends who claim to believe in Jesus, but they don't act like it. They don't talk like it, they don't act like it. You'd never know. Well, we can say the same thing to them. Hey, look, your faith is dead. I'm not saying you're going to hell and you lost your salvation. I'm saying, look, you believe in Christ, let's see it. You believe in Christ, you ought, you ought to be showing some fruit under righteousness. That's a very, very valid teaching for all believers. So we can say that some people get saved and they're on fire for a week or 10, and then all of a sudden they don't look like they even believe in Jesus. But if you ask them, do you still believe in? Yeah, I, I, I believe Jesus is my Savior. He's my Savior. I know he is. I haven't been living right, but they're still saved, right? Even though they haven't done anything good for anybody for 10 weeks. Isn't that the teaching that we get from the, the revelation of Paul and the Holy Ghost regarding righteousness by faith alone? So we see that all the time, that people are still saved, still born again, still believe in Jesus, still have eternal life, but yet they've missed something in the, the action part of a real life of faith with God. Fair to say, right? I think that's the teaching of this passage. Some have said James and Paul are in conflict with each other. I say they're not at all. I say they're not at all. Then I want to uh, present that James actually is presenting some faith principles that you can apply to all sorts of areas in your life to know if you're in faith or not. Like if you're in faith, if you really believe that Jesus is your provider, how many of you believe he's your provider? That the Lord God is your father and your provider. You believe that, right? You believe that? Okay. You sure? Okay. If... If you believe that, then there will be no, absolutely zero wringing of the hands at home. What are we going to do? 
Oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Let me calculate. There will be no panic. There will be no worry. There will be no fear. So in the house, somebody could challenge you and say, you have faith? Oh yeah, I'm trusting God. (laughs) That family member has a right to say, show me your faith with your works. Show me your faith with a different attitude. With zero. Like if you really have faith that God's going to provide, the house will know it. Because you'll be, glory to God. Don't worry, family. God's going to provide. Already talked to him. Everything's good. Glory to God. My God shall supply all of our need. Kids don't need to worry. My spouse doesn't need to worry. God is on the scene. We are not worried at all. You just watch and see. Now I can say, I see your faith. That's a faith principle that you need to put into your life so that you can examine your own life. One scripture says, test yourselves, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. And this, it could be talking about the general overall faith in the body being saved in in Christ. It could also be talking about any area of life that you're trying to trust God in. Like if you really fully believe that Jesus is your healer and that you're healed by stripes, what would be different? in the way you're thinking and acting and talking and plans you're making and in theory, I know that you all believe God is your source and your supplier. And in theory, you all believe he's your savior. He's your joy giver and he's your healer. I know in theory, you all believe that, but if you really believe it, let me see it. And the first place you're going to see it is with your mouth. The first corresponding action that faith has is mouth. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, thou shalt be saved. So if I believe something, the first sign that I believe it is I'm going to say it. Verse 19, you believe that there's one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Here he's going to bring in demons into it. Because there's plenty of people that say, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. But believing in Jesus is not enough to be saved. I mean, it's the first half. And it is, you know, the main foundational piece to believe. But then there's a corresponding action that God's looking for. There's a corresponding action that you better say something. The demons believe in Jesus, but they're not saved. Why? 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 Because they've never confessed him as Lord. They're going to one day. Every knee will. Every knee will bow. Every tongue confess. But the demons have not confessed Jesus as Lord. And they've not been baptized in water. They've not taken any corresponding faith step that reveals that they truly believe in their heart. And that's why when we help people get saved, the first thing we do is make them say something. You believe the truth? And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Then, Then you must say some very important words. Let's hear it. Because no man can call Jesus Lord except by the Spirit. Demons can't call him Lord. Only by the Spirit can you call Jesus Lord. Only if you truly believe it can you truly mean it. And God knows what's in there. So the first corresponding action, you can apply this principle to it, is that faith always says something. It expresses itself. That's the first corresponding action. Verse 20, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. He's quoting a scripture from Genesis 15 where God said uh, because Abraham believed in him, he counted it to him as righteousness, credited it to him righteousness. And then because Abraham believed, he did follow through later on with a test. Verse 24, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the hearted also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So we, we know that principle, as the body without the spirit is dead, you've seen a dead body before, kind of looks like the person that used to be alive, but they're not there, are they? You can tell they're not there. They're as de- lifeless as can be. Without the spirit, the body is completely uh, different. 
You ever looked at them? They don't have any life in their face. There's, you can't even make a dead body smile. Except we have, we have a, a person here that can do that. That's his job and he makes them smile as best he can. But without the spirit in there, there is no real life. Same thing with people's faith. There's some Christians that have great faith. I know you believe. I know you believe. I know you believe. You're sitting there amen and you're raising your hands. I know you believe it. I know you have faith. But you need to be honest. Sometimes you have dead faith. You're believing in something that you're trying to pray for and you're, and you're worried to the hilt. On, on paper, you believe it 100%. In reality, you're 100% worried. We could say your faith is dead. Nobody wants to be told that. So one-on-one, -on -one, you would not accept me saying that, would you? That's why you need to receive it from the pulpit because then you're like, well, maybe he's not talking to me. I'll let it slide. He may not be talking to me. In your personal life, you need to allow yourself to be honest. <clears throat> okay, so, so what James is doing primarily is talking about principle. He's also telling the Jews, listen, your faith in Christ is dead. I don't think he's saying you're going to hell. I don't think he's saying you've lost eternal life. He's saying, listen, your, your faith is dead, man. You, you, you haven't come fully into the, into the light here. I think that's primarily what he's saying. But there's so many principles about how we live a life of faith, we need to acknowledge that. Uh, so why would, demons, why would demons be brought in here? Well, it helps us recognize he's talking about, I mean, you believe more than demons do, right? You have more faith than demons do because you've taken the second step. Um, Uh, I wrote this down. Uh, faith without works is like decaf coffee. Yeah. Oh. Decaffeinated coffee. Oh. It's like, <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? <clears throat> uh, it is interesting that James wrote this letter uh, from somewhere 10 to 15 years after Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, and then Paul didn't write his letters until you know, somewhere in the 50s AD, so 20 to 30 years after Jesus. So Paul's revelation didn't spread throughout the whole church for quite a while. But, but there's a couple interesting things that happened probably after James wrote his letter is that it became clear. So I think if James would have written a second letter, he'd have written it to the whole body, not just the Jews. Because Peter didn't get his Gentile vision and get the first Gentile family saved and born again and filled with the Holy Ghost until probably right about the time James wrote this or just after. And so in the timeline of things, there's a little bit of, because uh, you know God didn't ring a bell when Jesus ascended to heaven and say, okay, the law's over, all you Jews. Stop living by the law. Don't sacrifice any animals. He didn't do that. He let the gospel spread organically and he, and he let the gospel be preached to all these people that were still practicing Judaism. And it took a little while. And so you'll see a little bit of progression how the, 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 the apostles were ministering around the world to Jews and Gentiles in different ways. Uh, but even the Acts 15 council, matter of fact, turn there, Acts 15 Remember when there was a dispute, these, these people were getting saved, these non-Jews were getting saved, and uh, everybody was a little uh, uncertain what to do because people came from Ju Judea saying, these men need to get circumcised now. These people that believed in Jesus, that's wonderful. We, we applaud God, but you need to get circumcised under the law of Moses if you want to be a really good Christian. They're like, wait a second, this doesn't seem right. They didn't even know the answer. So it's not like God downloaded the perfect gospel to every believer at the same time. He needed the gospel to spread organically through the preaching and teaching. So they said, let's go, let's go talk to the apostles and find out what to do with these people. Who's right? Chapter 15, verse 1, certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, saying, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension, <laughs> that means it was a big one. 
and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others should go to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they came to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, it's necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now the apostles and elders came together to discuss the matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, men and brethren, you know that a good while ago, God chose among us that by my mouth, the Gentiles, non-Jews should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God who knows the heart, notice that phrase he uses, God who knows the heart acknowledged them, who? The Gentiles who believed. God acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He saved these Gentiles and gave them the Holy Spirit because he knew their heart. This is long before they did any good works. Long before they did any good works. That's how everybody gets saved and filled with the Spirit. It has nothing to do with your works. Now, James, at this point in Acts 15, James is the head of the elders. He's the head of the apostles at Jerusalem. He's the brother of Jesus. He's not James that was beheaded. He's the brother of Jesus. Verse 10. uh, Verse 9. And made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Not by faith and works, just by faith. So what James was preaching was not against this. He's talking about something different than than initial salvation and righteousness. Verse 10, "Now, now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Saying no one was good enough. All of our fathers failed the law. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them. And after they'd become silent, James answered and said, men and brethren, listen to me. Simon, that's Peter, has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take them, take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree. And he quotes from scripture, verse 18 Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore, I judge. So James is going to give the final judgment from the president of the organization. (laughs) Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from these things, things from things polluted by idols, sexual immorality, things strangled, and from from blood. Just because that was the trend of these non Jewish nations. They were total heathen in lifestyle. Let's at least stop these first things because they they don't know better. They're already saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. Once you're you're saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, you're sealed. You have the earnest of his expectation. You have the first deposit of our salvation that the Holy Spirit is proof you have eternal life. The witness of him inside you is proof that you have eternal life and he won't take it away unless you completely reject Christ You've got it and you'll know it. So he says, here's these four things. Let's tell them to avoid these things. He didn't say, tell them to start doing good works all the time in order to get saved or stay saved. Now we'll finish this with James chapter two. There's one scripture I skipped in there. James chapter two. James chapter two, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? And then he's going to give an example of what he's talking about. He's not going to tie it together. He's going to give an example to help you understand the point he's making. But people have tried to connect them, and that's where they went south. Verse 15. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace and be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, so that was an example for faith. Also, faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. Some have read this together saying, if you want to be saved by God, you must have faith in Jesus and you must do good works like feed the poor. If you're not feeding the poor, you're not even saved. 
But that's not what he's saying. He's saying, look, if you tell a person that's uh, hungry, be filled, praise the Lord, but you don't give them any food, it didn't help them. That's all he's saying. Faith has works with it. Faith does something. If you really believe in Jesus, get on your knees and bow before him. If you really believe in Jesus, receive Christ, get dunked in water, go to church, get filled with the Holy Ghost. Let's see some action with what you really believe. Whether it's for initial salvation or whether it's for trusting God for anything in your life, if you believe it, you need to respond with some action. And the example is, hey, in in a case of somebody that's hungry, you can't just tell them to be filled, you gotta do something. He's not saying to be saved or to stay saved that you have to uh, always be nice and kind and good to the poor. I mean, if we have to start trying this, we're going to really fail. I mean, think about it. I'll give you a couple examples and then we're, we're done. Uh, let's see. I helped a lady with her groceries today and I passed out five tracks. Oops. But I also uh, committed to something and then backed out at the last minute. Didn't keep my word. Ugh. Oh, and I was irritable to, at work and inconsiderate to my coworker. I'll do better tomorrow, God. I hope that I did enough to stay saved. See, isn't that weird? Isn't that weird? Don't fall into that trap of thinking, oh my gosh, I haven't done anything good for people lately. Am I still saved? You don't need to go there. If you believe in Christ, you're still saved. You, you might need to repent from, from lukewarmness or from backsliding or whatever, but don't, don't let it... Uh, challenge your, your eternal life. John wrote in the first John, he said, you know, I write these things so that you can know that you have eternal life. You can be confident in your eternal life and in your righteousness with God by faith in Christ. You're not perfect. You're never going to be perfect. We wish you were perfect. Your wife wishes you were perfect. You'll never be perfect, but you're in Christ. He's perfect. So between you and God, you're accepted, you can smile, you can feel comforted. He loves you, he accepts you, he receives you because of Jesus Christ, not because you're good, not because your wife told you you were good, not because you're... this, This type of thinking has robbed many Christians of a good, strong life, having a hesitation about my own salvation all the time. Well, I don't know. I know Paul said by, we're saved by, by faith alone, but James said that my faith is dead if I didn't do anything good. Am I, did I lose my salvation? No, you didn't lose your salvation. You need to stick around church long enough to have it you know, implanted and grafted from God's word into your spirit so that you feel good uh, and that you can know how to get forgiven and trust the Lord and uh, rely on his blood to cleanse you from unrighteousness. So wonderful and powerful. It does take a little time to get the truth in you enough to feel confident with your relationship with God, even though you were kind of ornery yesterday. It's like, oh, I did some good stuff, but I was kind of ornery. Yeah, you need to know how to handle that with God. You need to just admit it. Say, God, ah, I had a terrible attitude today. Forgive me. Boom. Forgiven, cleansed, perfect again in fellowship. Amen. Praise the Lord. James is certainly not saying that you need to be perfect in all of your works. He already said, if you go to James chapter three, verse two, we all stumble in many things. <laughs> We're all sinning in many silly ways. If anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man. So he's not saying that you're gonna have to be perfect and believe in Jesus. Got it? Got it. Praise the Lord. Is everybody happy? Yes. Thank you for joining Pastors Chaz and Joni today from Houston Faith Church. If you're looking for a good home church in Houston, Texas, we'd like to invite you to be our guest anytime. What you'll find is that Houston Faith Church is highly committed to the Word of God, the love of God, and the Spirit-filled life and ministry that Jesus expects. We know that everyone wants to make a difference in this life, and that the Great Commission of the Lord Jesus Christ is the main thing for all of us. You'll find your purpose here and grow strong in faith at Houston Faith Church. Find more faith-building resources on our YouTube channel or subscribe to our free audio podcast. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Instagram. See you soon.